Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Mark's Side of the Ring with Miguel, Nick, Fred, and Tim. What's going on, guys? How are you? Hey, Conrad, how are you doing? Thank you so much. And guys, as you just heard, this is Mark's Side of the Ring, and we have our special guest on today, the king of the wrestling podcast, the podfather himself, Conrad Thompson. Conrad, thank you so much for joining us here today on the show. We're really excited to have you on. Hey, guys, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we have a really jam packed show for you today. We have a lot to discuss, but before we do, I'm going to kind of kick it over to my co-host, Nick. Nick, if you don't mind just telling the viewers at home how they can catch all of our shows, just kind of go ahead and plug it away real quick before we get started here. Absolutely. First and foremost, so happy birthday to the nature boy. I'll take the mask off now since I'm not next to anybody and I don't have to wear one. Uh, you could check out our show, Mark side of the ring on YouTube under the true exact channel which uh, the show drops on Saturdays. We finally have a Twitter now. So it is at Mark side of the one. So Mark side of the, and then the number one. Uh, so we'll be communicating through there, letting everybody know of any exciting shows we have coming down the line. Sharp bets and fantasy sets. One of the other shows on true exact was off this week, but we're going to come back next week with the baseball preview. We're going to break down over unders of almost every team. So Tim be ready for that. On the True Exact show itself, we have Peace Paradox, who learned music through slam poetry. And on Random University, actually a great show for the month of February, they ran down African-American uh, inventions and scientists uh, that we tend to overlook, uh, which was a great show. Uh, really, really cool to listen to. And then obviously next Saturday, Scott, a.k.a. Mr. True Exact himself, is breaking down the top 15 slow songs. From 1999 to 2000, and that'll be on the Instagram Live. So we got a lot of stuff for True Exact, as always. You could catch all of our shows on YouTube, but you can also catch them on our website, www.trueexactradio.com, and you can find our merchandise, you can find our previous shows, you can uh, check out all about us. So fun stuff, Miguel. A lot of great things coming from the True Exact family. So let's jump right on to today's topic. So obviously, we're going to address the biggest news of the week in pro wrestling, and that's the big show now known as Paul White going to AEW. So I want to kick it off. And Conrad, obviously you being the guest of honor, you're going to get the first question here. I want to know what are your, what were your immediate thoughts when you found out that Paul White joined the AEW family? Good for him. You know, I mean, I'm happy whenever anybody uh, gets a new gig and hopefully he's making more money than ever, but, uh, I can't say that I was shocked. It's not like he had been used a lot lately. And, um, you know, I don't know what else there was really for him to do in WWE. You know, it felt like on WWE, he's just, you know, it would just be just another segment. Uh, but with AEW, everything he does will feel special because it's a change of scenery. And hopefully that means that, uh, you know, he's going to make a difference for AEW and, and make some money for him and his family in the process. Yeah, I, I think it was definitely, for me, it was somewhat of a shocking move, especially because of the fact that he was on the, uh, Raw Legends night about what a month and a half ago. So when I saw the news on Twitter break that he had joined the EW family, to me it was, I, it, it was definitely a surprise move. Fred, what were your thoughts when you first saw that he was coming to AEW? Do you think that he should continue to wrestle? Uh, well, I was shocked that that he made the move. I always expected him to be a WWE lifer, even after his wrestling days were done. I expected him to just carry on as an ambassador, similar to how Mark Henry does, and guys like that. Um, Sergeant Slaughter did it for years, but you know, he's still in, in a area in his career where he, where he can go. Um, and like Conrad had said, he wasn't really being utilized. What else was there for him to do in WWE? And the money was right. Money talks. So who knows where big show is at in his life? He could have, you know, needed the money. WWE uh, apparently was giving him a lesser offer than he originally had. He didn't want to take that. And here we are. So I think he should continue to wrestle. He's not, you know, past his, you know, prime prime where he can't go anymore. So why not? You know, it's a huge advantage for AEW to have him on the roster for special appearances, not a regular, you know. Yeah. So, Nick, I want to pose the question to you and, and, and Conrad, just so you know, this is a topic that we've addressed before somewhat, even before uh, Paul White going to AEW. Nick, do you believe that there is a double standard in pro wrestling? And the reason I'm asking for this is because, uh, there's a lot of fans on social media that will obviously talk about Goldberg maybe being a little bit past his prime and shouldn't be going for the WWE Championship or Universal Championship every time he comes back to the WWE. But now at the same time, some of these same fans seem to be really excited to see Paul White in AEW. So 
This one will go to Nick and uh, Tim. Do you guys feel like there's any type of double standard in pro wrestling? I know it was funny when you uh, text us when we first found out, and obviously I sent you guys uh, the message first when I saw it that, you know, Paul White was all elite, and you guys kind of wrote back, Miguel, you wrote back specifically. I better never hear anybody talk about Goldberg uh, fighting for the title. And to me, they're just so different. I mean, I understand the title is a prop. We've heard that multiple times on, on some of Conrad's shows himself. But, you know, there's a difference between the guy, you know, a part-timer coming in and fighting for the, the biggest title in professional wrestling versus a guy coming in and almost an ambassador in a teaching role. I don't think at this point, and no disrespect to the big show, who to me is arguably the greatest seven foot wrestler of all time. I mean, one of my personal favorites, WCW versus NWO world tour from the 10 64. I think I always picked uh, the giant as my wrestler of choice for that. So a uh, big fan, but I think people are kind of tired. Uh, WWE fans specifically, whether from heel to face, face to heel, also top five in losses. I know law. I just think people have grown tired of Big Show. He's obviously on the back nine of his career, but I think what he can teach the younger AEW, the hungry AEW talent, uh, you can't put a price tag on. So to Conrad's point, hopefully he made a boatload of money. It did seem like he felt, and obviously this is all rumor and innuendo, but it looked like he felt like he was a little disrespected in how he was used in that Legends night. So who knows if that led to it as well. But I'm excited to see Big Show wrestle in AEW. I don't necessarily know. But I'm, am I excited for him uh, after everything he's been through, getting an opportunity to do something different? I mean, to me, AEW knocks it out of the park every single time with how they utilize their past legends and manager roles, almost that old school booking, which I love about AEW. So good for Paul. Yeah, yeah Conrad, you know, I'll ask you, do you feel like there's a double standard in pro wrestling? I mean, would you compare this to maybe the whole Goldberg situation that went down about a month ago with fans kind of being outraged that he was fighting for the WWE Championship? No, I mean, you got to remember, this isn't the first time Goldberg has been back. I mean, Goldberg came over for the first time in like 04, I think, or 03, whatever it was. Uh, and he had a run there and then he came back. And when he came back, immediately beat Brock Lesnar to become the world champion. And people really dug it. It was some of the you know, most critically acclaimed stuff he had ever done. But now it just feels like we're going back to the well too many times. And, and the difference being, you know, we're talking about a guy debuting as an announcer versus a guy winning the world title. I mean, if Big Show came in on his first night, you know, choke slam the shit out of Kenny Omega and became the world champion, well, that'd be different. But that didn't happen. Now, if they push him off the building with a monster truck and he comes back with the Yeti later, we're going to know the fix is in. Uh, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I, I think this is a guy who's who's taken a uh, a second chance at wrestling. You know, he, he, we saw what he did in WCW, we saw what he did in WWE, and now he's got a second act. And maybe as someone more than just the big show, the big show for better or worse was sort of boxed in on the way he was presented in WWE. This is a blank slate. This is not going to be the big show. This is going to be Paul white. This is the guy we just saw with a Netflix show. So it'll mm -hmm. be interesting to see what he does from here. But as with everything, I take a wait and see approach. I think a lot of people have been jumping to conclusions, not only about big show, but about Tully and about sting and let's see it before we dump on it is my response. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree, Conrad. Um, you know, I think Big Show has a lot of opportunities, you know, that he can explore in AEW, as does Sting. We, You know, uh, I think the Sting thing has been intriguing so far. Uh, and there's a lot of other guys, I think, that maybe feel underutilized in WWE or already aren't being used at all. Um, somebody that comes to mind, a guy that you would now have a podcast with, the Kurt Angle Show, which I enjoy incredibly, Kurt Angle. Do you think that we could possibly see him ever show up in AEW now that his WWE contract um, was terminated back in April uh, during the whole coronavirus, you know, situation? Maybe it's possible he comes back. I know he wanted to retire, which you covered uh, last week on the WrestleMania 35 episode, which uh, we had the pleasure of being at, actually, in New Jersey. But do you think maybe he does come back for a a one-off in AEW. He's wrestled in almost every promotion, so it would be something pretty interesting, I think, to see him show up. No, I don't think he'll wrestle again. I think he's uh, decided he's going to retire, and it's going to stick. And, yeah. uh, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me, I guess, to see that he showed up for an appearance here or there. And I don't know why you wouldn't. 
Uh, it's not like he's going to burn a bridge with Vince. If he were to do that again, I'm not saying that I have any insider information. I haven't spoken to anyone about it. I don't care one way or another, but, um, I think he'd probably done all there was to do, you know, I mean, Vince knew this was his farewell tour. He knew that he was retiring and he put him in the middle of the card and sort of the death spot with Baron Corbin. And it is what it is. And then, you know, he hung around a little bit and helped where he could and, you know, did some GM stuff when he needed to. And helped as an agent a little bit, but ultimately they made the decision that this wasn't the best fit. So he made a business decision himself. And and I would assume if he shows up in AEW again, it's about as JR likes to say, cash and creative mm-hmm. as far as seeing him in a ring again. I don't think that's going to happen again. Yeah. I think it's probably best maybe that he doesn't, um, wrestle in a ring just to avoid any possible injury. He's already had a, an amazing career. Why possibly, you know, jeopardize that. But is there anybody that else that you think maybe would be a good candidate to show up in uh, AEW that's currently on the WWE roster, even if it's not a guy past his prime, like a current guy that maybe you think isn't being used properly? Well, how long is this show? <laughs> <laughs> I know I, they have a lot of guys that they don't use properly for sure. Well, I, I, I don't know that that's necessarily fair. They have a lot of guys and they don't have a lot of time. I know people complain about raw being three hours, but you look at the size of that roster between raw SmackDown and NXT and what's in developmental because really NXT and developmental are sort of two different animals now. Yeah. Right. That's another thing. Yes. They've probably got 200 performers or more. How can you, how can you have a great story and competitive matches for all 200 in what seven hours a week? It's just not realistic. So they've got more talent than they know what to do with probably the biggest roster they've ever had. Even going back to the heyday of the eighties, there's more talent than ever. Not everybody is going to get their right amount of time to shine. There's a lot of guys on that roster who could have a phenomenal 20 minute match, but what do you tell the other, you know, 292 guys who were waiting in the back. So uh, the, the trouble with WWE is there's not enough time to promote everybody. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's dozens of guys who could show up in AEW and do phenomenal, but there's probably just not enough time. I mean, I don't think necessarily that everyone who comes over is going to be a major impact player though. You know, I I'm a huge fan of, of Miro and I thought Rusev was going to come over and take over the, the, the whole company that has not been the case yet. Now I'm not judging it because I'm willing to have a little bit of patience and see what the payoff is and where this thing builds. But I do think before this thing is over, Miro's in the main events, but I think everyone else assumes, oh, Zach Ryder's here. He's going to be in the main event. Miro's here. He's going to be in the main event. Big shows here. He's going to be in the main event. We don't know where that is yet. Like, you know, I don't think being the, the, the top guy or having a title match is really the end all be all these guys at the end of the day, we have to appreciate I have more insight on their creative there than they did in WWE. They probably have an easier schedule. They maybe have less politics. And if the pay is similar, who wouldn't want that? Uh, and when you're competing for airtime, I like their odds of being on dark or the new dark show and dynamite better than making the air with raw or SmackDown. So, you know, if your dream is to make a living in professional wrestling, you've got plenty of options. I just think it comes down to those two C's that Jerry always talks about cash and creative. Maybe you make a little more cash in WWE, but you have a little more, uh, you know, insight into your creative on AEW. So, so do you feel Conrad that Paul going to AEW now kind of bust open the doors for more talent to listen and listen closely than maybe they were before? No, I think Jericho did that his first day. Uh, when Jericho went over, that was yep. already the talk. Uh, and then when you saw, you know, Miro come over sort of the same thing and not only that, but Huber and, uh, th- there's a lot of guys who have left WWE who are in AEW now, whether it's Moxley, uh, or it's Brody or it's Miro or it's big show or it's Jericho. I'm not saying it's becoming WWE light. I do feel like for a long time, TNA made a mistake of whenever anyone leaves the WWE TV program, now they've got to be in the main event right away and impact. And I think that Tony Khan is conscious of that and doesn't want his program to necessarily be WWE light to an outsider. So I think he's been selective in who he's brought over and he's been pretty smart about the way they're positioned because it would have been easy. I mean, I just think back to, and Lord, I I love Dixie Carter, but think back to when, when Dixie was running impact, if Miro left, he'd have been champion in two weeks. Oh, for sure. 
Uh, but that's not the case now. And we're, we're being patient and we're telling stories and we'll get there. And I think Tony Khan pr- should probably be applauded for his patience there because I think we will see Miro as a champion in the company. I just think we've got to have a little patience and, and doing it that way is probably smart for the long-term plan to not sort of turn off a bunch of AEW fans who were jaded WWE fans. I mean, you guys know there is a double standard. If WWE does something, people dump on it. If AEW does the same thing, people love it. That's the gist of the question two questions ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but my attitude has always been, let's see it before we dump on it. Let's see how they're used before we dump on it. And you know, there's a chance that this big show thing is going to be awesome. We've just got to have a little patience and wait and see. You know, Tim, I'll, I'll, or I'll pose the question to you because there's no secret that you're obviously a huge AEW fan, right? W- what are your immediate thoughts on Big Show going? Do you think this is good for business? And where do you see the future going? I literally think this could be one of the biggest moves that AEW made. And it's not for Big Show or, or Paul White wrestling in the ring physically, right? Him on the on commentary poses some advantageous spots for them. Him being a mentor to the big guys that they have who haven't really been quote unquote giants, no pun intended, right? You, you got Brian cage monster. You have Wardlow, a monster, Luchasaurus, a monster, Lance Archer, a monster, any type of knowledge that those guys can get from one of the best big men of all time. It, it, that it goes beyond whatever they're paying him, right? That I don't care what the dollar value is. That knowledge alone is way above anyone else that they could assign at this point in time they need they need a big guy right all their guys are small you know who the, who the people fighting for the title moxley and and uh omega and they're not big guys by any stretch of the imagination they you know i know vince loves the big guys if AEW can build somebody up to to fight against them uh, i i personally would love to see it how big does a guy need to be to be champion no nah. Probably not big at all. I mean, Rey Mysterio was a champion. Okay, wait Daniel a minute. Bryan. Hang on now. You just said a minute ago, these guys are not big and they're fighting for the championship. John Moxley's six, two. He's taller than Shawn Michaels. He's taller than Bret Hart. I'm just asking how tall, how big does a guy need to be to be champion? Uh, size is a perception. I guess you're absolutely right. I, I just personally, yeah, all right, you're talking to the wrong guy. I don't like John Moxley at all as champion in AEW, I don't know what it is about him. Good for I you. He's not, he's not champion. I don't know. But when he was, and he's still fighting for mm. time, I can't, I can't see him as the guy. Did you see I, AJ styles as the guy? Cause he's shorter. No, 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 no. All right. Size. I get what you're saying <laughs> about size. I'm just devil's advocate. It, it would be nice to have a big guy that could fight on top at AEW. Well, I understand to, to me, I'm looking at match quality. I, I would much rather have a, a good main event than guys who were big in the main event, because based on what you just said, you want Yokozuna and Mabel to, to battle it out for Supreme. Well, oh we don't need that again. <laughs> well, I mean, those are the biggest guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would love to have a big guy perform well in AEW. They have big guys who perform well. Did you see Lance Archer this week? Well, what a, that, that, that's what I'm saying. Any, anything to make him better than he already is, is would be great. I'm not saying, I'm not saying they're bad as they are advanced right. knowledge from a guy who's been there for 22, 25 years, as long as Paul White's been in the business. I mean, he fell off the top of fucking Kobo hall. I, yeah. <laughs> give me, give me Yeti. a, <laughs> we were just, we were just there last week. We saw it, but I, I, I get you. I understand what you're saying. You don't need a big guy to be champion, but I would love to have a big guy versus small guy. I, I, I don't like seeing the small guys versus small guys. It is, does it sell? Are they doing well with it? That's up to interpretation. I no, guess. it's not. They're profitable. They are doing well with it. They're beating I mean, NXT every week. Uh, they're the number two wrestling company in the world. So they're doing better than every other wrestling company except for WWE. And nobody will ever be WWE. Yeah, I think at this time, it's like, you know, but being number two, though, is not a, a bad thing at all. I mean, in, t- in today's on, wrestling though. landscape. We're, we're having a discussion about Kenny Omega as champion. And, and Miz is WWE champion. I wanted to get, yeah, I wanted to get so, to that. I'm just saying, what are we talking about? Which kind of wrestling do you prefer? And don't get me wrong. I love Miz. He's one of the best sports entertainers yeah. around, but nobody's going to confuse Miz and Kenny Omega. No. Nobody. Yeah, I, I agree. I, 
I, I don't think there's any comparison you can make. And, you know, obviously I think it's a great transition to the next topic that we want to talk about is Miz as WWE champion, right? Which was a huge shocker that we saw elimination chamber, right? Miz cashing in after Drew McIntyre had successfully defended the title uh, inside the elimination chamber. But, you know, Conrad, I'll go to you first on this one as well. Does he make it past Bobby Lashley? And if not, what was the point of this whole booking? Was it just to get the title onto Bobby Lashley without having him take it right off at Drew himself? I kind of expected something major like this to happen simply because they've got one big show on Peacock before they go to WrestleMania. And they've got, that's really a trial run, a test run, if you will, to make sure that they've got everything worked out. All the bugs are worked out. You don't want a disaster on WrestleMania day. You want to talk about pissing off fans. That would be it. So I think you need this, this pay-per-view now becomes more important. Once upon a time, the pay-per-view between the rumble and mania was almost a throwaway show. Nothing really was going to happen. Now something did happen. I think something even bigger happens at the next show. I don't know what it is. It wouldn't surprise me to see Brock Lesnar back. It wouldn't surprise me to see another title change. I think they're going to shake it up in a major way. And right now where people are sort of lukewarm on the idea of WrestleMania, it's because they don't really know what's going to happen yet. And I'm not saying even WWE does, but I think that first show on Peacock has to be something that makes everybody stand up add attention, pay attention and want to get that service rocking and rolling so they can see what happened before they get to WrestleMania. So I don't think Miz will be champion at WrestleMania. I don't think he'll be defending the title there. He's going to drop it at that, that first show on Peacock is as that's my guess, but I would also guess that we see other faces. It wouldn't surprise me to see Rhonda back. It wouldn't surprise me to see Brock back. If Peacock is paying a billion dollars for this service, they want something big on their first show. You think back to that first show that we had on Fox with SmackDown, we had something major happen. Kofi got squashed in a hurry to Brock Lesnar. It wouldn't surprise me to see something like that happen here. And what if in between now and then they set something up? Man, I'd be good with a with a Kofi Brock rematch at WrestleMania. I'd be good with Brock and Lashley at WrestleMania. I'm not saying Brock's coming back. I'm just saying anything's possible. Uh, will Becky be back? What does that look like? Uh, oh, something major, maybe two or three things major will happen on that pay-per-view and what happened will make a lot more sense at that time. Do we see a title change as early as next Monday, right? Cause the Miz is scheduled to defend the title against Bobby Lashley. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it could set up another match. So the idea is, you know, you use that match to set up your pay-per-view match, whatever that may be. And maybe it becomes multiple people. Maybe it's a, a, a it turns into a tag match on Monday. I don't know. I, I haven't talked to Bruce. I don't ask any questions about creating. <laughs> uh, but I know when I say stuff, people say, "Oh, well, he, Conrad must know because Bruce told him." No, I don't ask. But I just know if I were if I were booking the territory, the the first thing I would think about is how do I satisfy Peacock who just gave me two hundred and fifty million dollars this year? I give him a badass show. And how do I create the biggest WrestleMania possible? I've got to have a lot of stuff happen at that show in particular. And then hopefully do a monster rating the next night on raw, because everybody's talking about it and wants to see what happened. And now we really have a, a real WrestleMania card formed. Maybe we don't announce matches, but people who are paying attention know, oh, it's going to be this guy and that guy from the outside looking in right now. That's how, that's kind of hard to call. So I think it'll be fully formed then. Uh, yeah. I think that, I think those are all interesting takes. Not really anything I really thought about until we just started talking about it but a lot of that what you're saying it makes perfect sense to me nick i'll ask you does based on the last 10 years right it's been almost it's been over a decade now since Miz been day to be champion do you feel that everything he's done for this company that he deserves to enter wrestlemania as the champ i mean i, I i'm you me and tim and I, we're just fans so i don't know all the blood the sweat and the tears that Miz has gone through i thought his first heel run uh, as champion. You know, we're talking about a guy who forget it. You know, I understand the rock was involved, but here's a guy who beat John Cena in the main event of WrestleMania for the biggest title in professional sports. So you can't take that away. That, that'll that's ingrained in stone and it'll never go away. The Miz is a phenomenal talent. Do I like his character right now? I, I'm not a huge fan of the correct or any of this stuff. It's just variations but I thought the Miz first time around was excellent as champion. I think he makes a great old school heel champion who like, as JR has mentioned it, like he could get his ass kicked every single night, but you know, finds a way to escape with the title. I don't think he's going to uh, make it past Bobby Lashley, but that's, you know, a topic for another day or maybe later in this show, but does he deserve it? Absolutely. He deserves it. Just like he said on Monday night, 
nobody thought he was going when he first came out. Nobody could have imagined this. But again, we're talking about a guy beat John Cena, WrestleMania, biggest title. Not many people can say they did that. Yeah, the, the Miz deserves it. it. Conrad, without knowing anything, right? And there's just this kind of go back to the money in the bank real quick. What do you think was WWE's initial thoughts with booking Otis? And why do you think they did that? just to kind of get it off him, to get it on the Miz, to have him lose it, to give it back to him? Do you think they just maybe didn't know what they wanted to do long-term planning back in May when they first gave it to Otis? Well, I mean, I think part of this too is you've got to appreciate we're in a COVID world and we don't know exactly what all has happened, but I can only imagine there's been a, a bunch of ideas that couldn't actually be fully realized because for one reason or another, there was a health situation. And I imagine there's been quite a few shows that were written and then the day before or the day of when somebody was exposed or whatever, everything changes. So I don't think it's fair in this particular circumstance over the last 12 months to look back and say, well, this doesn't make any sense. Why would they do this? Because, well, they might've had half the roster, not there all of a sudden. And it's not like they can disclose that because of HIPAA laws and everything. And obviously they did with Drew, but that was Drew's decision. But I can only imagine that this is something that, uh, when we look back and we get to talk about it one day, it'll all make sense. I don't know exactly what it was right now, but I know that this last year, that's certainly been an issue. I mean, we, we saw that, you know, Jericho had it, but we didn't know it for months. And we, we saw the young bucks weren't on TV for a while. And then just Matt was, but not Nick. And it comes out that Nick was sick. And, um, you know, we just talked earlier about Lance Archer and he had it and there's no telling how many people have been affected by it. I was, and if I was on TV every week, people would wonder, Oh, they're burying Conrad. He's not on TV this week. No, I'm home. Yeah. Sick. Right. Uh, you yeah. know, that's just part of it. But uh, I think we, when we get through this, things will be a little bit more back to normal. Hopefully that's by WrestleMania and all the roster has been vaccinated, but maybe that's optimistic at this point with that being less than two hours away or two months away rather. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think everything they've done, for this past year is so commendable. I mean, just the fluidity of everything, you know, dealing with all the different, you know, restrictions that they've had and possible outbreaks. I mean, the fact that they've put TV on, you know, every week, multiple shows out of the week, pretty much without a hitch. I mean, you know, they may have had certain situations, but hell or high water raw has been on live every week. SmackDown has been live on every week. NXT, AEW Dynamite, they've all produced their television. And I think, you know, in, in this world, you know, you have to really uh, grade them on a curve, so to speak, for anything that you maybe didn't agree with because you don't know what the situation uh, technically really could have been behind the scenes. I mean, we were lucky that Drew ended up being okay. He was only gone for a couple weeks. I commend him for coming public with it and then making it part of a storyline. Well, not storyline, but bringing it out on TV. Um you know, and then, you know, who knows? What if he wasn't okay to face Goldberg? You know, you build this huge match. It could have very easily been canceled. So I think, you know, in in this situation, yeah, we have to just take every week as it as it comes and, and see where, you know, where we go from here. And like Conrad said, hopefully by WrestleMania, things will be a little bit more normal, at least with having fans in the stadium. That'll be, a you know, a, a big change, some sense of normalcy to the wrestling world. I, I have to imagine that. You know, and I don't know anything about producing television, <laughs> but I have to imagine these past 12 months have been some of the most stressful times in WWE and AEW to, to Fred's point, putting on weekly content without fail every single week since mid-March, right? Not knowing what's going on with this um, pandemic, right? And not knowing, you know, God forbid somebody test positive for it. So uh, I do commend them big time on everything that both companies have done over the last 12 months or so. But uh, we are coming up to obviously the biggest show of the year, right? WrestleMania. And, you know, this is something I was thinking about the other day, and I wanted to get everyone's take on this. It could potentially be, and obviously there's still about a month and a half left, right? I think there's 45 days till kickoff for WrestleMania or to the first night of WrestleMania, I should say. 45 days from now, it, as it's looking today, this could be the first WrestleMania, Conrad, in 27 years where we see, don't see guys of the likes of The Undertaker, John Cena, Brock Lesnar, Triple H, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think that this is WWE's pretty much coming out party to see, hey, like this is the current talent? I mean, I, and I know, of course, we have someone like Edge, right? Edge in the main event fighting for the Universal Championship. But besides him, at this given point, do you think this is WWE's best attempt to kind of go public and say, well, this is our roster going forward? I mean, it, it, nobody that you just listed was on the show 
last year with the exception of Brock and Taker, right? And Taker was in a pre-tape thing and Brock was in essentially a squash against McIntyre. No, I, I don't think it's that different. I think this will be a weird WrestleMania like last year. I think people will look at this as a transitional WrestleMania. When people go back and they talk about last year's WrestleMania, they'll really probably talk about two things, Undertaker's match and the Funhouse match and probably nothing else. And I think this year's mania will be different because it won't be in front of a packed crowd. Yes, there will be fans there, but it'll still be weird. And, you know, I don't think when people think back to their favorite WrestleMania moments, these two shows are probably going to make the list. And that's not based on the creative or the matchups. It's just based on the circumstance, but no, I mean, you're still going to have guys like Randy Orton and, and so many others who've been there forever. Uh, and I'm glad they're there by the way. Uh, but I don't know that we need another undertaker match. And I'm not sold on the fact that Brock won't be there. Uh, and, and I'm not sold on the fact that John Cena won't be there. I know he says he's not going to be there, but that's kind of the, that's kind of what you do. Like I remember back in the rumble days, you know, Chris Jericho would be posting pictures of his family at the beach somewhere else. And ta-da he's in the rumble. So I'm not sold on the fact that Cena's not there. I'm not sold on the fact that Brock's not there. And I think they'll always have a spot. And I think next year, the rock will be headlining WrestleMania. I would be cool with doing Brock and Roman this year and putting sort of Heyman as the monkey in the middle. And then next year do Roman rock and then really pass the torch and make him the head of the table and do it in Dallas in front of the biggest WrestleMania crowd ever. And everybody will be at capacity because that Texas by the end will say, Nope, put an ass every 18 inches. And <laughs> I, I, I think it'll be, I'll be one of them. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people will be, they'll be so ready to, to do something like we used to, you know, before and who better to do that. And who would want the credit for doing that more than the rock. So rock and Roman next year would be one hell of a story to tell. And it would be cool if it was rock and or, or Brock and, and Roman this year and, and, you know, Roman goes over and says, you know, there's nothing left for me to do. And what do you know? The next day on raw, we call out rock and we've got our, our course chartered a year in advance, much like they did with Cena and rock before. And you're positive. You haven't talked to Bruce about it. <laughs> I just made all that up, but that's <laughs> pretty good. Game. I know we got off on the wrong foot, but I, 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 I know you skipped me on the Miz thing, but I, I love Miz. Miz is going to be a future hall of famer. I know he, it's a, it's, He's a he's a small guy. I, I know. I, I I didn't mean I don't like the small guys. He's a he's a great he's a great character. It takes a lot in this business to be a bad guy and actually be a bad guy, right? He's he's a different he's a different character. But sure. look, look, look at the ages of some of these guys you're talking about. Taker's what fifty five. Cena's forty three. Rock's forty three. Triple H, sorry, Miguel is fifty one. I know that's your boy. But if they're old enough to be my my dad, like give some of the younger guys a chance to shine on the biggest show. And the best part about it, give them a chance on the biggest show, not in front of what was, could be anywhere from a hundred thousand people in, in the audience, right? Let them get their feet wet. Let them let them show up at WrestleMania. I, that's my personal opinion. Uh, I'll probably get shit on again. Go ahead. Yeah. Terrible take. I feel like you're here just to give all the terrible takes. You have a great shirt, but everything else about this sucks on your side today. Uh, you know, the, the, here's the thing. Nobody talks about age. I just talked about this with Eric Bischoff. Nobody talked about age in wrestling until Vince McMahon started making fun of Hulk Hogan and the macho man for being too old. And he started to say, we're going with the youth movement. I mean, the rock and roll express just won the tag titles two years ago and people were excited to see it. Luthez wrestled until he was seventies in his seventies, Jerry Lawler wrestled until he was 70 still is. I think occasionally. Yeah. On the Indies. Yeah. So the, you know, it, it's not about, you know, by the way, let's make a rock and roll analogy. When was, I mean, the rolling stones are on tour until they're way, way up there. There's so many classics. People love nostalgia and what they grew up on. It's less about who has the best matches. It's more about who can sell the most tickets, who has the most interest, who has, who's over. I don't think WrestleMania should be viewed like it's, well, it's your turn. No, I mean, either people are behind you or they're not. And, and, and Daniel Bryan proved that by the way, it didn't feel like he was going to get that WrestleMania spot, but he was so over, they couldn't deny him. And when that happens for that talent, that'll happen for them. And I know that some of them will probably hear this and be pissed off by that, but that's reality. Uh, you know, uh, recently Cody Rhodes made a post on Instagram 
where he talked about working with big show and WWE and he went to big show and said, Hey, I don't want to do comedy in our matches anymore. And big show patted him on the knee and said, well, go get over please. Because the idea was Cody wasn't over with the crowd. So the only thing he could do with him to get a reaction was to do ha ha. And it's up to that talent to figure out how to connect with that audience. By the way, Becky Lynch did it two years ago. So it is possible. This isn't something that happened decades ago. I just named Daniel Bryan and Becky Lynch as two folks who did it. They willed their way into the main events. So did Kofi Kingston in a weird way. I mean, Kofi Kingston did it in a 30 day run too. So it's possible for anyone on the roster, but it's not necessarily no one deserves to have it. It's based on who's going to get, as Jr. used to say, an ass every 18 inches. The rock will do that. Brock Lesnar can do that. If, if the other talent can let's see. Uh, but I, I don't think that it's necessary to say, give them a chance to get their feet wet. Dude, what the fuck have we been doing the rest of the year on raw and SmackDown? If right. you would have did it there, they'd want to see you here, but you know, not everybody who had a good season gets to play in the super bowl. You had right. to be the best. And right. if you well, were the best, about, you'll be on that card. What about the people who were doing it all season and they deserve the shot to be at WrestleMania and they bring back these part-timers. You, there is there a, like, I, I don't know me personally. Well, hang, last, on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Who just won the super bowl? The last one. <laughs> Who just, won the Super Bowl? Who just won the Super Bowl? Was it An not the guy who's won more Super Bowls than everybody? Is it not the oldest quarterback in the league? Now, did he do that because someone scripted it or because he was the best? He was the I'm best. just saying the WrestleMania, th this is not fucking peewee football. This is, this is promoting. This is, this is selling tickets. This is filling arenas. How many wrestlers can they put on the marquee at WrestleMania that will fill it up now? You could argue where well, WrestleMania, the brand will sell it on on itself, but guess why that is because they haven't been putting guys who were on main event, the TV show in the main event, they put the Hogan's and they put the rocks. And by the way, when people talk about WrestleMania three, yes, they say the best match was macho and steamboat. Did all those people pay money and buy tickets to see that match? No, they bought it to see Hogan Andre. So there's nothing wrong with promoting attractions, but. You have to be an attraction first. And I know you would say, well, how will they be an attraction if they don't have an opportunity? They had 52 weeks of TV. And before they got here, they had however many years there were. Not everybody's going to be in the main event. And by the way, WrestleMania is two nights. Lots of people have opportunities to be on WrestleMania. Before it was two nights, WrestleMania was seven freaking hours. <laughs> Lots of people were on the show, but you can't have a 300 person roster. And, 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 and feature everyone that's just not possible. So the po the folks who were over, who, who, who have sold the most merch, who fans have gotten behind. And by the way, that is really the way people look at it. I don't know that everyone listening has figured that out. They think that the guys in the back who are writing the scripts or whatever are just arbitrarily saying, I like that guy. If you want your guy, if you have a guy and you want to pull for them buy their merchandise. I don't know this for a fact, but I'm sure if I texted Bruce Pritchard right now and said, Hey, who are the top five merchandise sellers on raw and SmackDown? He knows we've never talked about it, but that's a metric they can look at and see who's over. And these days it's hard to do because you're not running a and B towns with house shows. And you can say, well, if Roman's on the card, we sell 6,000 tickets. And if he's not, we sell five. Okay. Now you could say Roman sells us an extra thousand tickets. That's real. But right now, you know, who's over bad bunny. He's buying a bunch. He's selling a bunch of merch. If you think he didn't have a WrestleMania match, you're wrong, but it's based on what people are into. Who's going to tune in the WWE product and who are they going to buy merch for? They're in the business of selling stuff, not rewarding eighth grade football players with a starting position. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Fair. 100%. Uh, Conrad, you mentioned the marathon versus the two nights. Are you a two night WrestleMania guy? Or are you a marathon guy? What do you like more? I like two nights this year because it's going to be, uh, you know, a different thing. Uh, and then moving forward, I would like for it to be one night and four hours. And if we can't get it done in four hours, put it on the NXT show. And if that doesn't get it done, <laughs> put it on raw, but sitting in the same seat for seven hours sucks. And by the yeah. way, I would much rather not even be on the show than be in the first match on the show because people aren't in their seats and they don't really care. So, I mean, yeah. if I got to go run around on the super bowl field before the game actually kicked off, I'd rather just not like, I, I don't want a consolation prize WrestleMania appearance. I think it's a great point. And, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about 
in terms of, and you're a big sports guy, and I have a sports specific question, uh, Alabama pseudo related uh, a little bit later, but I wanted to get your thoughts on. So I, I think as a big sports fan, we've all seen the, the graphs where they say build a lineup for $15 and you have your $5, your $4, your $3, your $2, your $1. And, you know, truth be told, I'm not sure who controls uh, WWE on Fox, but I'm sure you're aware that they sent out a tweet last week that I think has since been deleted and basically was about that with the, the women's uh, wrestlers. And there was an outcry of wrestlers coming out and saying, you know, unfair, untrue. Uh, I think Zach Ryder, you know, Acordonis said this is this is a really shitty thing to, to post. And we saw Natty uh, say some stuff on it, too. I mean, do you think this is just the, the times now that we're in where people get offended over, you know, things that are just commonplace? Or do you think this is more a sense of this is sports entertainment? It's different uh, than professional sports. I just saw one the other day with the NFL. Will Fuller was a dollar. Will Fuller's a phenomenal wide receiver. And Natty Neidhart's a phenomenal wrestler. I didn't look at it as she's not worth anything. Uh, I looked at it as great value, but that's me. What, what are your thoughts on that? Are, are the wrestlers a little too sensitive? Do you think it would have been the same if they did it for male wrestlers? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Here's my question on the NFL thing you asked. Did the NFL tweet that out? I, honestly, I, I don't know 100% who tweeted it out. That's the difference to me. I think if the media does it, like let's say Sports Illustrator did it, fine. If one of my podcasts did it fine, if, a, if just a fan, not, not, not a show, not a member of the media, no one in the public eye, just a regular dude does it fine. I think it sets a bad precedent when the company does it and people would say, it's not WWE, it's WWE on Fox. Same thing. Stupid. Yep. I mean, the reality is they're paying hundreds of millions of dollars to do it and it's their show. And so because they have influence on the way the show is positioned and, and written and all that you're not only setting a precedent to the fans of how you view them, but you're almost like giving a performance review in public. Mm -hmm. And that would be weird. If you were at, let's say you work at McDonald's and it's time for there to be performance review and the manager in the middle of the lunch shift just stood on the counter and started shouting out, Jenny, you got to step up your game on the fries. They fucking suck. And <laughs> Billy start pissing in the milkshake machine. They don't like it. You know, like, you can't do that. Like, that's a closed door. Now here's the thing. Whenever we do performance reviews at my mortgage company, I have honest conversations with them, but it's usually behind closed doors. I'm not saying don't yeah. do it. Uh, I'm not saying don't, don't coach them up. Definitely do that. But to go out in public in an entertainment business and say, you're more valuable than this person. Well, at that point, why not just go ahead and disclose their actual contract values? I mean, to me, if I were one of those folks who was disclosed as being a dollar, I would be like, okay, I'm going to remember that next time I go in to negotiate my contract. And some people would say, oh, you're taking it too seriously. And I recently heard Jim Cornette say the same thing, but I don't think Cornette had the context of the WWE tweeted this out. This isn't yeah. fans and media are supposed to talk about that. Like sports talk yeah. radio exists to say this guy's better than that guy. I mean, I get that. That's fine. But when the company does it, I think you set a bad precedent because the folks who the way wrestling works is by the way, in real life, wrestlers don't refer to each other as jobbers. That's not what you do with your coworker. You were, I'm not actually beating you. you. You are making me look good. I've, I've been fortunate enough to be on the a side today and I'm going to win. And unfortunately you're going to do me the honors, but it's up to you to make me look good. I didn't really beat you. So your NFL comparison is a little off for two reasons. One who tweeted it. And two, it is entertainment. So it's not the same thing. Nobody's actually worth five times more unless you go out and you disclose, Hey, this lady sells five times more t-shirts. And now we're just discussing facts and disclosing where it is. And that might actually work for fans of like, in this case, Natalia, who was rated at a dollar. Hey, I'm going to buy a bunch of Natty Neidhart t-shirts because I want her numbers to go up. And by the way, she does better when you do that. That's different. <laughs> I'm okay with that. If you think pro wrestling tees discloses who the top sellers are for any other reason than to motivate you to buy more shirts, you're wrong. So if that's what we're doing, I'm fine with it, but to rank it creatively and the company put it out, I just think that's party foul. I think that's incredibly fair. And I'll ask you my one non wrestling related question. And obviously you're, you're a big uh, Alabama fan. I, I got to ask you, Nick Saban spoke glowingly about him. I'm a huge Philadelphia Eagles fan. Right now, I'm cautiously optimistic uh, on one Jalen Hurts. 
Should I be excited about him? Should I be nervous? What what should I be thinking as an Eagles fan with Jalen Hurts going in as my starting quarterback? I don't know that he's going to be the best quarterback in the league, but he will be the heart and soul of your football team. He's a natural born leader. He's all you could hope for in being a team player. When he lost his job to Tua, uh, he was the picture of what you would want as a teammate. He couldn't have handled it any classier or any better. Uh, I hope he is a Philadelphia Eagle for a long time and a major contributor. That said, is he going to grow out, go out and break every NFL record? Probably not, but he won't cost you a lot of games. And when he does, he'll hold himself accountable. He'll hold himself to a higher standard and he'll get better. I think Jalen hurts should be a valuable contributor in the NFL for years and years to come. If he's not the starter, he'll be the MVP as a backup because he is Mr. Team. So I think he's a great asset for your team. I don't, I mean, listen, your division fucking sucks. So he's probably going to win the division, but that's, that's akin to being the, you know, the manager of Burger King. So he'll probably do fine, but I don't think he's going to have Peyton Manning, Dan Marino level hall of fame numbers. But as far as a guy who you're going to love and he's going to sell a lot of jerseys and be a team leader and a good guy, like he's going to do a bunch of charity work in your organization and he's going to be a good representative of your brand. And I think you'll win a lot of games, but I, I'm not going to say, oh man, y'all are winning the Super Bowl next year. That's yeah. Probably not the case. Fair, but I, uh, I'll take your advice and buy his merch anyway to get him over. So yeah, I appreciate go. it. And listen, that matters. If you think for a minute, like Tony Khan's probably fixing to draft Trevor Lawrence and people think he's the second <laughs> coming. Here's a surprise. Yeah. He's not going to be, he's going to be great. He's going to do well. But one of the reasons you draft that guy is you're going to sell a bunch of jerseys. You're going to sell a bunch yeah. of tickets. Uh, he's over. And I know one of you guys in the box of gimmick shirts is going to say, well, they need to give that third string guy a chance. He's been busted ass all year, <laughs> yeah, but he's not selling tickets or jerseys. So fuck him. Hey, those yeah. are two different sports, my man. Two different sports. <laughs> Love it. All right. Have you ever, who is your favorite NFL team? We know you're a big Alabama fan, obviously in college. Who's your NFL team? Uh, wherever Tom Brady's playing. I've been, a, I was a huge, I am a Patriots fan. Okay. I just love the story of when they won uh, the Super Bowl after 9-11. You know, if you remember, the greatest show on turf was the Rams. They were setting every record there was. They got individual entrances at the Super Bowl and all the crazy pyro. Meanwhile, fresh on the heels of 9-11, a team named the Patriots runs out as a team, and the starter had just gone down, and now there's this kid that nobody really believed in, and somehow they're doing okay. And then at halftime, you've got U2 playing, and they've got all the names of the victims from 9-11 on a screen playing behind them, and it falls at the end just like the buildings did. And Somehow, some way, they overcome all the odds, and they beat the Empire with a game-winning field goal. It was like out of a movie. So I was like, dude, this is my team right here. And then, of course, they became the evil Empire and had a bunch of controversy, and everybody hated them. And since everybody hated Alabama, I kind of was like, all right, I'm comfortable with that. That's fine. <laughs> But when there was a parting of the ways, I was really pulling for Brady and I bet on the bucks to win the super bowl. The very minute he signed. And when Gronk went, I was over the moon. I think that's one of the best quarterback tight end relationships in history. And I love their story. And I was really happy to see him win and nobody thought, saw it would come. And I was happy to see him make a drunk ass of himself and throw the trophy around and let us see a different side of, of Tom Brady. And I don't think he'll do it again. I'd love to see him win three more. Uh, but I don't think that's realistic, but I think he's proven all he needed to prove. And he's probably the best quarterback that ever lived. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Absolutely. And then this is coming from a giants fan. So, uh, we have some fan questions for you, Conrad. So we want to kind of just jump right into them here. Uh, first question is art from Atlanta wants to know, how did the idea of Starcast come about and will we eventually see a Starcast five? Uh, yeah, I'd love to do a Starcast five and just bring what we're doing on adfreeshows.com to the stage and then involve a handful of, uh, high profile meet and greets and other shows, but I don't know when that'll happen. You know, that feels like a long way off. I don't know that it's realistic to think it could happen this Labor Day in Chicago, but maybe next Labor Day in Chicago, but it would be in Chicago at the Hyatt Regency in Schaumburg, Illinois. If I'm going to do another one, I'm going to do it in a space I'm familiar with with staff I'm familiar with. Um, but you know, yeah, I'd like to do more. The idea came about just because I wanted to do a podcast convention in place of Greg Price's NWA legends fan fest that he quit doing in Charlotte the first week of August. And when I tried to do it, it had already been booked by a major wedding that they couldn't bump. So it was just sort of shelved. And then I saw Cody and the bucks talking about the idea of doing a super show. I bumped into Cody at international baggage claim that year in January, when he was coming back from wrestle kingdom, we started texting back and forth. 
He liked the idea. I asked if I had it, any of it on paper. I said, absolutely. I sent him a word document. He loved it. Sent it to the bucks. They loved it. We were off to the races. And, uh, eventually when the AEW thing became a reality, they said, Hey, we, uh, we'd really like your help in getting this thing kicked off. Would you do one in Vegas? And I said, sure. So I secured space and we swung for the fences and had a lot of fun. And then, well, the world changed. Hit quite the home run with that. Uh, John in Long Island wants to know, also a StarCast question. What goes into the booking of StarCast? Do you manage it all yourself, or do you partner with the team to get all of your talent on board? Uh, I usually booked all the talent myself, uh, but I have a group chat that I talk about sometimes, uh, and I've got a ton of my really great wrestling friends in there, and I'll bounce ideas off of them, and they'll pitch some back to me. The name StarCast was actually created by either Mark Nielsen or Matt Coon or a combination of both. Uh, but we were thinking about combining podcasts and then like the gathering. Well, the gathering was not the juggalo thing, but Starcade. Uh, and since, you know, it was sort of Cody's deal and Cody was stardust and his dad created Starcade, It was like, yeah, this makes sense. So we created that. And of course, at the time, the bullet club was the hot shit. So we made the logo look similar to them and, uh, we were off to the races, man, but no, we had a lot of fun with it. And, uh, the group chat is really responsible for helping book the concept and the ideas of each event. Even if I had an idea, uh, and, and I loved it, I'd pitch it to them. And if they poo pooed it, it was a good sort of test case, you know, but before you see some sort of TV show or whatever, uh, they're going to go ahead and, and do a controlled test and let some people take a view of it and, and, and take a look and give some feedback. Well, I did that with my group chat and that's how Starcast came to be. I just want to jump, um, jump it off of the, uh, sarcast, uh, talk. Uh, it was obviously well documented a couple of years ago when you originally had the undertaker scheduled for a star cast appearance and that set the internet on fire. And then of course he was pulled. It was even covered, uh, in the last ride documentary. I don't know if you had seen it, but they, they bring it up, which I was kind of surprised and thought was an interesting touch, but, um, just wanted to get your thoughts on that whole situation, you know, um, obviously business is business, but just like how you felt like, you know, if you were upset, obviously that undertaker got pulled, but just your general thoughts on the whole situation. Uh, yeah, I was upset that undertaker got pulled. I mean, we had a signed contract. They approved the creative. They knew how it was being released. They sent me the photo approved my graphic or promotional graphic. I wired them half the cash up front. So yeah, I was out a couple of nice Toyota Camrys and, uh, <laughs> they weren't, they weren't going to be there. So it was disappointing. It was even more disappointing when WWE said they were going to make it up to me. And then they didn't, um, um they were going to, uh, they, they promised me we were going to get replacements. And by they, I mean, Mark Carano, uh, and then it didn't happen. You know, we talked about a couple of different ideas and the ideas that they thought were suitable replacements. I disagreed with, they asked what I wished for. I sent my wish list and they turned that down. So it didn't happen, but we didn't need it. It was a great event. People had a lot of fun. Uh, but I made sure when I came back that I overcame the stigma that I couldn't deliver because there was a LOL Starcast LOL wins undertaker coming thing online. So I pulled out old jumbo and CM Punk was at Starcast three. So any doubt that I could deliver was immediately gone. He had a home run fans loved him. I love doing business with him and he bailed me out in a major way and I can't thank him enough. Yeah, no, that was a that was a huge get. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to go to a star cast yet. I, I hope to eventually get to one. Be a, a big thing for me to to go to. I'd love to. Uh, speaking of going to though, I, one thing I want to bring up. Uh, I know you had mentioned it before on on multiple podcasts, but you uh, mentioned it as early as as recent as this morning on the Jr. podcast. Jr. Uh, talked about ECW and One Night Stand. You mentioned you were there. Well, I was there too back in, I went to the 05 and the 06, probably two of the best shows I've ever been to, especially the first one um, in my entire life. I just wanted to get your thoughts, what your favorite moment was from the original one night stand in 05. And do you think we ever see anything like that again? I mean, a lot of talk was made about doing a WCW one, but we're going back 16 years now and we haven't seen one. Do you think we'll ever see another ECW reunion or that's over with, been there, done that? And if not, do you think a WCW one down the road still all these years later? No, you can't do it now. Everybody's too old. You know, that yeah. sucks, but I mean, father time is undefeated. So no, I, I don't think it'll happen. It's just too far gone now. I, I, th we don't need another ECW one. They continued them to diminishing returns. Right. WCW one would have been incredible had they done it in 03, 04, 05, 
I mean, but even now that was 16 years ago. So no, it's too, it's too long, too old. Can't do it now. But yeah, I mean, imagine, you know, Oh four, Oh five, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, Bill Goldberg, diamond Dallas page, sting Lex Luger. It would have been tremendous, but we didn't get it. Yeah. I mean, at one point at that time, they practically had the main WCW roster on under contract around that time period. So it could have definitely been done, but uh, yeah, unfortunately we, we probably won't see that, but uh, yeah. And one thing I wanted to just mention as a guy from New Jersey, you, I shouldn't be saying this, but I say when I see an attractive girl, oh, baby, Roll Tide, baby. And people probably wonder, what the hell is this kid talking about? But that is my <laughs> thing. And also, we'll be at the bar and be like, damn, she is Roll Tide. And my friends, some of them who aren't, like, what? Well, you know. And then I got to, well, you know. I, I got to go into that. <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. <laughs> I, I actually borrowed the, the lady thing from a dealer in um, Las Vegas. I think it was Mandalay Bay. It might have been MGM Grand. But it was this older guy. And I'm playing blackjack with him. And whenever an attractive girl would come by, he'd go, woo, woo. He'd just watch her go by. <laughs> but it was a way to signal me and my buddies, hey, heads up. Woo. And so that little woo, I was like, all right, I got to come up with something. And in Alabama, it's almost like in Hawaii, I guess, with Aloha, you know, you're opening the door for somebody or they're opening the door for you or whatever at a gas station. We're nice down here to people. Uh, if that guy's wearing an Alabama hat, you just say roll tide. And he says, roll tide back. It's like our own language. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we did that and that worked. And so I thought when he, woof, I was like, okay, I got to come up with my own thing for that. Cause not everybody would get it all the time. But right. if I just said, Hey, roll tide and just look with my eyes, everybody knows what I'm talking about. And amongst my friends, it worked. And I started doing it on the show. All of my little stupid shit that I say on the shows are things I say in my real life. And then, uh, it just happens to be in front of more of my new friends. Yeah. I love it. I've picked up a ton of stuff from, from the shows, not just that, but that's the main one I always use now. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta get down to Alabama. I, I truth be told, I've never been there. Have you ever been to Jersey before? I yes, I have. I, I, I go to New York all the time and I've been in New Jersey for wrestling. I can't tell you how many times and, uh, twice for mortgage stuff, but yeah, I've been to Jersey before. I like Jersey. It's sort of like, um, uh, I don't know. It, it, it reminds me in certain areas of Tennessee as random as that sounds. Um, but yeah, I like New Jersey. I think New Jersey gets a bad rap. I think when people talk about New York and New Jersey, they talk about New York more favorably, but I've had just as much fun in New Jersey as I did in New York. That's curious. What makes you think of it as partly part of Tennessee? So the, there was a, a specific area and I forget where it was, but there was a part that just reminded me of um, certain areas of Tennessee. I can't describe it driving on the highway. I mean, but there was some area I went through hmm. and I was, uh, I was asleep. It was a long road trip and I woke up and I looked around and I'm like, dude, this looks just like whatever the shit part of Tennessee I was thinking of, but it was, it was, in, <laughs> it was in New Jersey, clearly not in the winter. Cause there would have been snow everywhere, Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was in the summertime. And I was like, dude, this is sort of like, uh, Tennessee. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. You know, the, the highway systems, so many of them look just like each other, especially when you get into where it's more wilderness. I mean, clearly we're not rolling through Jersey city and I'm like, this is like Knoxville. Different yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. The Jersey has so many different parts. You, you could think you're in a different state, just the, depending on where, what part of Jersey you're in. It's crazy. Yes. So uh, if, if I can get my moment to shine before Conrad shits on me again, it, see, it's great because Pro wrestling fans, myself, yourself, Conrad, we can have different opinions on things, and sure. we can still we can still be very, very good friends. Absolutely, your merchandise. I could love listening to you. People can hate listening to me. Maybe it's my shtick. I should <laughs> I should keep it going, right? But savewithconrad.com, Yeah, you, you shit on the guy who is going to promote you at the end, right? Thank you. That, that, that. That, yeah, that's things, right? Are you available in New Jersey for anyone who could? Uh, need your expertise in that field. No, absolutely. Yeah. We're licensed in 40 something States. We have a pending application in New York, but we're approved in New Jersey. And by the way, if I wasn't contrarian the shows, not any good. Like if you guys have ever listened to sports talk radio in Alabama, it would be boy, Alabama sure is looking good this season. I don't think anybody will beat them. That's exactly right. Bob we will be back after these words. That's not entertaining. <laughs> you need the second guy to say, I don't know, man, you know, when, when, when their starting wide receiver went out, I mean, that guy was the heart and soul to their team. 
who could step in for Waddle? Oh, well, I think this Devonta kid might be okay. I don't know. He doesn't have the snaps. He last year, he only caught so many balls. He's clearly not a favorite. I don't know. We'll see after the break. Well, who do you like, you know, Waddle or Devonta? Do you think Devonta could fill the shoes? We'll discuss it coming up. Well, listen, man, if I get on here and I'm like, man, you guys are wrestling geniuses. We agree on everything. That's boring. So let's spice it up a little bit. And I'll just yell at Eric Bischoff every now and again. It was fucking daytime, Eric. And people oh, that's and we're off to the races. If you just call me Eric Bischoff again, I will love it. I will just take that to the bank. Well, I wanted to make sure I had a tan as good as I could today so that I was ready See? for the uh, main event. You know, Th those moments are what people still talk about on our show oh. when we're hooting and hollering and yelling and fussing because it's entertaining. And so, yes, this is infotainment. We are trying to spill the beans and give you some truth and give you some dirt and a peek behind the curtain and give you some information, but we're also trying to entertain you. So every now and again, I'm going to challenge somebody on, well, how big do you have to be to be champion? Uh, and I know I'm being contrarian or being an asshole and I'm smiling the whole time I'm saying it because I know this is going to be a good debate. Here we go. So that's seven, seven one, one, one if you need to listen to I'm sorry. Everybody was talking to the same. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I would just say the best is you, uh, you and uh, Bruce about Hogan with uh, post WrestleMania nine and that whole situation. And when they brought it up on the icons and Bruce was interviewed, I internally, I was like, oh my God, I, can't. I was like, can we get a comrade interview? And as far as this icons, just to, <laughs> yeah, listen, that was fun. You know, I, um, I got blown up on Twitter when that aired because they kept you know, he kept the narrative alive, but we've debunked that the tickets were sold out. We didn't need it as an added attraction. We didn't right. need that a value add. You can't sell any more tickets, but you know, as with everything else on WWE network, it's not fact-checked. Right. And lastly, before anything goes wrong, uh, I love Steven singer <laughs> and so does my girlfriend. I love manscaped one, two, whatever point oh you can have. Now we're getting we're getting too we're getting too personal now. Too. Having yeah, having my father call me to find out what Manscaped was was an awkward awkward conversation to have. And I have one quite one last question. It's it's simple. We did a podcast a month ago. It was your favorite Royal Rumble. It was basically a draft. We all took turns picking. Conrad, you have the number one pick in the Royal Rumble draft. Please tell me why. It's the 92 Royal Rumble when Pop Pop won and had a tear in his eye. Well, it's actually 97. Oh, oh wow. All right, guys. See you later. This is it's Conrad's favorite year. Come on. We know that. <laughs> well, here, here's why it's great. I love the, I love all the characters that are in it. You got a ton of hall of famers. It was the coming out party for Stone Cold Steve Austin. Ric Flair was already established as being Ric Flair. He was already the top guy when he came in. He was already the real world's champion. You already knew him as a brand. At that point, the most Stone Cold had accomplished was U.S. champion for WCW. He had never been the top guy. He had never been the world champion. So for him to be in there and just rule the roost, flipping guys off, doing push-ups, and then be sitting on the turnbuckle, Hitman's music hits. He puts his hands on his head. He's not sure how to handle this. Hitman eliminates him. The dirty bastard cheats and slides back in. It told a great story. It made the February pay-per-view matter. People complain about that February pay-per-view not mattering. Well, now we have the, the fatal four way. The winner is going to get the, the title shot, but because Sean loses his smile, the winner becomes champion. Really, really great stuff. I think 97 made stone cold. It cemented the Bret Hart. Uh, stone cold WrestleMania match, which is still to me, my favorite WrestleMania match. And it gave us a February pay-per-view that mattered that turned into a bloodbath because Vader just bled buckets. So don't get me wrong. As far as a single performance and becoming champion and all that, Ric Flair is the man. No doubt. I won't argue that for obvious reasons, but stone cold's 97 performance. I still think makes it the best rumble of all time. Where do you put 20? Uh, I just got, I got one more for you, Conrad, uh, for myself. Uh, as a kid, my favorite wrestler, Ultimate Warrior. And I feel like we're at this point, we're having you play your hits, but I'll never forget the episode with more ooze. Uh, I guess my question for you is we saw Randy Orton uh, throwing up what looks to be black ooze. Sometimes I feel like these things happen uh, off, not to say off of your show, but it, I mean, that had to have been an immediate callback for anybody who's a fan of yours and Bruce Pritchard's show. 
uh, that we needed more ooze to, for Randy Orton to throw up. Do you think that kind of stuff works in 2020 or, or 2021? I'm sorry. Uh, or do you think that stuff was, was old with, with the Papa Shango Ultimate Warrior thing? We're talking about it in the context of a guy who has a puppet show on TV, right? <laughs> yep. So I'm just saying we've suspended our disbelief we enough there. Like if we're going to poke holes in the Bray Wyatt Firefly Funhouse stuff, we're a little late. If that's what our issue is with, I understand that people drew the parallels. But let's be clear. There is almost nothing original in wrestling anymore. Everything is a borrowed yep. idea from somewhere. And I don't have any problem with what they did. I, by the way, I haven't seen it. I haven't watched Raw or SmackDown this last week yet. I'll get to I'm it. I'm sorry to spoil it for you. <laughs> no, I saw it all over online. I was getting tagged in all the ooze stuff, but I'm just saying, I don't know exactly how they did it, <laughs> but I know people were like, oh, this is terrible. They were just like, buddy. This Firefly Funhouse shit, are you kidding? This is some of the most crazy out there. I mean, we're throwing fire at people, and that's okay. But a guy coughing up ooze is not okay. Like, man, we had a match in John Cena's brain last year at WrestleMania. That's where the match took place. There wasn't even a traditional match. Like, no, I don't have a problem with anything that's associated with the Bray Wyatt character or the Fiend character because it just it feels like there are no limits. And I'm not surprised that we see stuff that worked in the past or they tried in the past because there are no new ideas in wrestling. I love the outside the box stuff. I think yeah. it, it brings a different element to the show. I mean, Undertaker's my favorite wrestler of all time. So uh, I have a, you know, a soft spot for that kind of, you know, stuff. But I think the Bray Wyatt character is the best thing on the entire show when he's on. I, and they've been telling a great story. I think week in, week out, that's been one of the highlights of Raw, whether it's hokey or not. I don't care. When Raw is off the air, the thing you mostly have been talking about the last two months has been something related to the Randy Orton, Bray Wyatt, Alexa Bliss storyline. So it's obviously working. And we're talking about it now, right? So that, that proves Check. right here. Yep. Last question for you, Conrad. This comes from Matt in Philly. He wants to know, during the peak of the Monday Night Wars, which sting would you have taken? Would you have preferred uh, the Surfer Sting, Crow Sting, or Wolfpack Sting in the WWF? Um, are we saying... At the time, or are we yeah, saying, yeah, during the peak of the wars. Okay. Well, the peak of the wars, it needs to be crow sting because that's who he was at the peak of the wars. But if I could have any version of sting in the WWF, I wish that the dingo warrior went to mid Atlantic championship wrestling and went to work for Jim Crockett promotions. And we saw Magnum TA and the dingo warrior. That would have been great. Uh, only because it would have meant we got sting beating the hockey talk man to become intercontinental champion and sting versus Hogan. I would have loved to have seen what sting and Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels and guys like that. in that transition period uh -huh. where they were moving away from Hogan and moving to the guys who could work, what would that have looked like sting and Yoko could have been the WWF version of sting and Vader I, uh, sting and undertaker as undertaker with a bad guy persona. And, and sting as the, you know, surfer sting, I think all of that could have worked. And I think if they were interchangeable, he would have succeeded. I don't know that warrior and flair would have really worked on Jim Crockett promotions, but it would have been interesting to see, but if I could get one version of sting, it would have been, you know, 1988 crow sting or surfer sting in the WWF. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, this was a lot of fun. Kyron, we really appreciate you jumping on today. Obviously, everyone knows where they can find you, but just in case there's one mark out there that maybe doesn't, how can the people find you out there? I'm on Twitter, pretty active there, at Hey Hey It's Conrad. I'm on Instagram, at Hey Hey It's Conrad Thompson. You can find all of my shows early and ad free at adfreeshows.com. Tons of bonus content there, including the new Jim Crockett interview that I think is the definitive Jim Crockett piece. We just dropped part one, part two is coming up real soon. And we're working on Title Chase Volume Two, where we chase down old title belts like what you see behind me. And uh, the tag title that Stone Cold held will be uh, episode number two. I'm pretty excited about that. But as you mentioned, I am in the mortgage biz. Um, hey, hey, it's Conrad as a handle, but I'm Conrad the mortgage guy on all my social media. And if you uh, have a need, you're looking to refinance or save some cash or buy a house with no money down, savewithconrad.com is your hookup. Holler if you hear me. Fantastic. Conrad, we hope to have you on again. Thanks so much for jumping on today. Guys, as always, make sure you tune in. Next week, right, Mark Sathering will be back with a brand new episode. As Nick mentioned before, you can find us on all different uh, podcast outlets out there. We have our website, trueexactradio.com, as well as find us on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, uh, all things podcast related. So we'll see you guys next week.
Thanks for tuning in today. Appreciate the love.